Another religious experience survived. And I can now most assuredly vouch for the fact that Ahsoka is a religious experience as every Tuesday I come closer to meeting God. One way or another. <laughs> you gotta have a little bit of faith in watching this show. Well, not entirely true. You need a lot of faith. Well, I mean, something happened today. Uh, and it taught me that if last week's episode was cut down to about 10 minutes and then just simply smooshed into this one, we might have had an episode of Star Wars on our hands. Mm, sort of, at least. Yeah, sort of. Uh, there was definitely a lot of action today. However, it kind of had a little bit of a uh, disappointing feel to it, wouldn't you say? You may be disappointed, Kyle. I'm a realist. <laughs> you see, I expected it to be garbage from the beginning. Also, is this just a trend now? Like the um, my Game of Thrones TV entertainment show about the dragons as well, where Godzilla ate the little dragon thing. That too was shot all in the dark. Well, it was shot during the day, and then they made it dark. But this show, too, all of the action takes place at night. Why do we film things at night, Kyle? Why do we do I think that? it's to cover up the fact that it doesn't look good. If you don't, if you if you have a hard time seeing it, you are not going to see the jank. And today, the choreography strikes again. <laughs> it's not good. See, okay. Part of the issue is that they're not doing the fight choreography very good, which makes the fight feel uninteresting. Worse still is the fact that the fights themselves have no impact or value at this point. Because these are franchised characters. They can't die. Sabine Ren can't die. Ahsoka can't die. The only question is whether or not they kill the villains, I guess. There's even a fight between two androids today, and they're just punching each other, and it's just like clink, clank, clank, clink, clink, clank. Like, wow. I have never been less invested in a fight, ever. No matter which one loses, the outcome for everybody else will remain the same. It's still gonna be boring. We're still gonna be here. <laughs> still... There was also, we did finally get to see a fight with Ray Stevenson and Ahsoka, which I was optimistic for, but. Well, the problem is, uh, this show killed Ray Stevenson, and you can tell that he's on his last leg here. He tragically yes. can. It's actually painful when we got to the Ray Stevenson fight. He is, you can see when he moves that his movements are slow and very, almost looking pained to do. Yes. It, it, it looks it, uncomfortable. Yeah, and a part of me is like, feeling like oh maybe like they shouldn't have got him to do this like he he's clearly out of his prime like they're trying to get these angles to work it would have been better to get a body double and just work with it that way somebody a bit more young and then switch the camera around so you just don't see his face or look alike the issue is he wasn't even that old you know in contemporary hollywood terms that is mm -hmm. where uh <laughs> But Indiana Jones is still up and about. <laughs> oh God! Don't remind me. I, I try to forget honestly, but it's hard to. <laughs> yeah, no. In in a universe where uh, where Harrison Ford is still considered an action hero, uh, then Ray Stevenson isn't actually that that far off. But you can clearly tell he he was not in the best of shape as he was doing this and there's also a big issue in the fight between him and ahsoka so he's clearly doing more of the darth vader style of fighting the uh, the heavy fighting that darth vader is famous for and this does not work very well with ahsoka because when you see the two square off ray stevenson is a head taller than ahsoka He's about twice <laughs> as broad, and he probably weighs three times as much as Ahsoka. Like, watching these two clench swords look mildly ridiculous. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, in order to make this fight look believable, Ahsoka needs to be nimble and constantly moving around. Because if she gets struck with a blow, it should feel like she's hit by, like, a train, you know? But here it's not the case. Like, she's, she's holding her blade equally against his, and it's like, you're watching this and going like, all right, the force augments her, sure, but the force also augments him. <laughs> you know, like that's not gonna work out so well there. It just it looks a little bit uncanny because the discrepancy there. 
They could have done better in the choreography yet again, and in this case, you can clearly tell that both are having a difficult time with the fight scene. It isn't awful, but it's... Man, like, Star Wars used to have a, a quality, like, you used to go watch it for the fights, you know? Yes, the choreography of the prequels, especially Revenge of the Sith, is absolutely fantastic. The speed, the energy. Um, this, sadly, has none of that choreography. And of course, the problem is that, yet again, none of the characters can actually die here because they're all franchise characters. And so at the end, Ahsoka is punted off a cliff uh, where she goes to meet uh, space ghost Anakin. Yes, apparently she had gripped the MacGuffin, and the MacGuffin, you know, gave her a little blister on her palm, so that somehow means that she, because it was witchcraft related, somehow she's able to tap into the Force in her unconscious psyche and commune with the, the Force ghost, I guess? No, 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 Cal, this is just what happens when you touch magic space rocks. Apparently, you get a little blister. Like, oh, no, no, okay. She, she grabs the map, <laughs> and it's hot, and she goes like, Wah, and then it imprints on her mind. This is literally what happened. My God. Like, I was yelling this at Starfield. This is an Starf Indiana Jones plot, by Starfield. the way. <laughs> you know, I was yelling at Starfield the other day for doing the magic space rock gives you visions of the galaxy thing, which has been so horribly overused. Like, it was already a little bit of a trope, but Mass Effect did it, the first Mass Effect. Now this seems to be the only sci-fi plot in existence, practically. It's like, I bumped into an artifact, this MacGuffin gives me sights of the future and everything. It's like, okay, like, I can get it that you want to establish some lore there. And even, I'll give Mass Effect a bit more credit. At least with the, it, it was a Prothean beacon, and the whole idea is that it imprints information on you. Yeah. It's like a warning message. The whole you know, idea of like, this doodad is it imprints information on you. Yeah, but it's not a warning. It's like you print a message, and the message is that uh, you need to uh, do the MacGuffin. It's like, okay. <laughs> okay. They de aged uh, Hayden Christensen a bit in this one. That, that's nice. They did better in Obi Wan, yes. The CG, you know, he does look a little uncanny when you get into his face, but uh, he his face is very much younger here. I think the all the flack they got for Obi Wan, where he just looks wrinkly. <laughs> It just did not look good. So they had to put some effort in this time around. I had to try a little bit harder. Um, oh, what else? Oh, yes. Oh, God. So the robot, the dumb little robot, is like, hey, you two women, stay together, tards. <laughs> and they yes. go like, yeah. And then they leave, and they immediately split up. In the next scene thereafter, <laughs> they're like, bye. <laughs> Let's fight separately. And then Sabine's like, I I'm winning against this this white-haired girl. You go on without me. It's like, oh, if you work together, you could probably take him out like pretty quickly because it's clearly a young Padawan. She can't compete with a, a master and, you know, like literally another person. She'll just be overwhelmed. Nope, they split up immediately. Splitting up, splitting up, splitting up. And because they split up and because they don't actually listen to the advice despite saying they will, um exactly what happens with the robot had theorized what happened would happen because they're not working together and instead of they're working apart uh they lose <laughs> yes so sabine hands the map back over to uh lord balaam i think his name is or better known as titus polo and he puts it back in his pedestal and well like that they're done with the map because it was interrupted you see because you know they, they couldn't they had to have a moment of um tension there i suppose I, I, for, I forgot about the tension part. Yeah, this, this scene doesn't have any tension. No, so when that happens, is. Is, you're just like, it's formulaic. Because nobody can die. There, there's a scene earlier on as well, where the, the general, the, the green tentacle-haired woman, is like, I'm a general, so I can disobey orders. And so she leaves the Republic's main battle fleet without a command structure, because she needs to go and find what Sabine is up to. And they, yep. they state, whilst doing this, like, well, once a rebel, always a rebel. And is this not just the core problem with the Star Wars continuum? They never grow into anything. 
Like, the Rebellion has won. They're the galactic power now. They are the establishment, and yet they're doing the exact same shit as always. Yes, this is very much a problem with Disney, because in the old lore, the New Republic formed, found its footing and became a new government. Here, it's the exact opposite. Disney wants to keep that rebel, you know, rebellion vibe, and so... Well, there is a new Republic government. They're not actually trying to become the government and they're not actually becoming the new status quo. They're rebelling against themselves now. <laughs> like, honestly, this would be better off if it was um, if it was Titus Polo and his gang like fighting a guerrilla movement against the new Republic. And they had to do all of this secretly. They had to be careful. They had to sneak around and stuff. They couldn't have a massive targeted ritual on an island somewhere. Or if they did, they had to fight off New Republic um, stormtroopers attacking them or something. It was a race against time. Because here's the thing. I do not believe for a second that Ahsoka is going to get so much as a scratch on her. Not, not a one. Sabine. Sabine's never going to be injured in this show. None of the, like, the general's not going to die. None of these important characters are so much as going to be inconvenienced. As it was demonstrated when Sabine took a lightsaber to the gut and walked it off within 24 hours. But if you put the bad guys in a clinch, oh, I can believe that Titus Polo's going to die. <laughs> I can absolutely believe he's going to die. I can believe that his apprentice is going to die. I can believe that the witch from Dathomir is going to die. All of these characters are expendable. Yeah, there's a lot more at stake with them, which honestly comes at a relief for today's episode because this episode actually focuses a lot more on their story and their perspective, which is a welcome sight, even though it's still not particularly good. But at least it's interesting because there's actually stakes involved with these characters. They might die. There's a 99% chance that they're going to die and a 100% chance that they're going to lose somehow. <laughs> exactly. And the, the problem there is, too, they're not presenting them as unscrupulous bad guys or anything. Like, Titus Polo hasn't done anything particularly wrong so far. The witch from Dathomir was found in some random jail cell somewhere, and they're going to bring back Thrawn. And they're like, well, Thrawn's going to reignite the Imperium. It's going to be terrible. Thrawn's like an extreme logical pragmatist. He isn't really going to reintroduce the Empire in the olden ways. In fact, I'm kind of intrigued to see what kind of Empire he might rebuild. Like, and not to mention, why is Titus Polo doing this? Because he says, like, oh, I'm doing this for a greater good. You know, creation requires destruction. What is he trying to create? Why... well... Why is he here? Why is he still doing the Jedi, 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 Jedi stuff? Yes, yeah, the Jedi stuff. Why did he betray the the Order? Because he survived Order sixty six, and he apparently then went like, "Yeah, Empire seemed like pretty chill, dude. So let me side with them in the future." Which is weird because the the whole Empire under Sidious was persecuting the Jedi. Perhaps he maybe met the Thrawn character and understands that under Thrawn's leadership, the Empire would be a a much stronger force for not necessarily good, but it would definitely be a much more egalitarian force. Yeah, so something must have happened to change his worldview rather radically. Especially as he was all, also a, apparently a rather established Jedi. Like, he knows of Anakin and he knows of Ahsoka and comments on their relationship and stuff. Like... Again, the problem is I'm far more interested in what the bad guys are doing than goddamn Ahsoka. Mm -hmm. By like, a long shot. Unironically, okay, what they should do here, they should pivot this away from the whole, like, we're the rebels thing. Because they're not the rebels anymore. They are the power structure. And they should instead put, still, instead put Ahsoka in the place of basically CSI. You know, make Ahsoka the police force here. And make Titus Pullo and guys the terrorists. Pivot it that way instead, because it's not convincing when the show tries to put them as the underdogs. It, and especially, the, their down fighter as well, which still doesn't have a scratch on it. Like, the robot tears up some panels and there's some sparks inside of the panels. I'm like, you did that! You did that! Yeah, no, you're causing the sparks. Like, it's like maybe... Like, honestly, all the battle did in the previous episode was it probably knocked a cord loose. Like, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> the ship is unarmed. There's no scorch marks. You're causing the sparks. 
But no, the, the, the ship is, to is totally wrecked. Like, the engines don't work despite them landing perfectly. You know, do not crash landing or anything. The engines are out, the, the comms relays, everything's worked. Okay, how? Yeah, how and fuck indeed. <laughs> oh my goodness. This, it's, it's honestly just astounding. Well, today's episode was by far, I think, in my opinion, I don't know about yours, but I think it was the best episode so far. It's still not a good episode. See... At least I'm I'm semi intrigued by um, purple haired woman Serene. There we go, because she hands over the the map from Treasure Planet, uh, and it's like, okay, if you come with me, I'll 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 show you Ezra. Okay, fair enough. So she has a reason to do this because she's really like One Piece. Ah, oh, Minakama, etc. Okay, fair enough. Fine. And she could also be plotting. She could say see her sensei get you know punted off the cliff and go. This man's gonna beat my ass seven ways till Sunday. Um, maybe, maybe infiltration is the best choice here. I should surrender, be taken alive. I've got a greater chance of getting revenge when he least expects it. Not to mention, like if she holds, if she destroys the map, she'll never see Ezra, and she has no idea if the transmission is done. She has no idea if the giant ship is still in orbit. Her best bet is to try and, you know, ingratiate herself here. So that, that's okay, that's fair and fine, you know? And I hope that's where they're gonna go with this, because I swear to God, if in the, the following episodes, she's gonna have a change of heart and go like, yeah, Ahsoka, I, I know I betrayed you and shit. I had no actual plan, but I kind of feel bad about it now. <laughs> I'll be fed here, no it. And she immediately goes back. No, I would like this, I would actually like this plot point that they're going down to be more like at least an episode or two, more than just an episode long. Like, actually explore and start to understand. And maybe what would be cool is to have Sabine actually empathize with them. To the point where she's actually having a difficult time deciding between her loyalties to the New Republic and her loyalties to them. That could be interesting. Also, I gotta point out, she's being, okay, Ahsoka's about to get Ito cheated off the cliff. And so she yells at Sabine, destroy the map. And she's holding the ball from Treasure Planet in her hand as she points yeah. her blaster at it, point blank range. Like, I'm gonna blow up my hand with this orb. <laughs> the worst part like, is, okay. Titus Polo stabs that thing with his lightsaber for a good, like, four or five seconds before it's cut in half. Her blaster wouldn't have scratched this damn thing. Which means that, uh, he was never particularly concerned about it, which actually stands up for making him a more interesting character. He himself said earlier that he would it would be a shame if, if one of them were to perish because there's so few Jedi. He doesn't want the Jedi to die. He himself was a Jedi. He's like a dark Jedi now, and he has no intentions of actually trying to kill any of them. He doesn't want to. He's, he's shown an aversion to. Hence why he only knocked Ahsoka off the ledge and didn't go for a killing blow. Ah... <sighs> Why must the villains be the most intriguing parts of a Star Wars show? That, that's a large part of the problem here. And the worst part is, of course, this show killed Ray Stevenson, so we're never going to get to know. There will never be a Lord Titus Pullo show, which is what we actually needed. Oh, don't worry. I'm sure they'll just take his corpse and puppeteer it with some CGI. It's not like Disney hasn't done that before. <laughs> I mean, if we're very lucky, we might get a Thrawn show, I guess. And if they do that justice, that that could be something, but... If they would actually go and get the actual author for the Thrawn series. See, I don't know if the Thrawn author is even being consulted here. So I'm just like, eh, I'm a little skeptical on how they're going to handle this. It, it literally can't work out the same way it did before because of the whole Rebels retcon of a bunch of children, you know, upstaged Thrawn and shot him to another galaxy it's like okay <laughs> okay and what also sucks here is even if thrawn gets his own story he's how is he going to be any semblance of a danger or threat as he once was even with so little resource even with his intellect due to the fact that we already know that episode seven happens and that there's no thrawn and there's no mentions of thrawn so presumably he has been dealt with imprisoned or killed yes which again reintroduces the problem that only the villains seem to have any sort of stakes in modern day Star Wars. We, the, the heroes are not in danger. Yep, the only ones worth rooting for are the villains. 
literally, <laughs> you know, you know the old saying, right? You know, you either die young or live long enough to see yourself become the villains. Well, we have the reverse here. The Empire, the bad guys in Star Wars, the Dark Jedi, the Sith, they've lived long enough to see themselves become the heroes.